everything <clears throat> begins with an idea. One great idea can change the world. Big dreams backed up by bold actions change the direction of our lives and change the course of history. One scribble in your notepad, text in your notes. One spark of inspiration. One unlikely invention. I have a dream. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think different, just do it. Ideas that sparked movements that continue to change the world. What if we as a church fully embrace the fact that we are divinely designed and uniquely equipped and fully empowered to do big things for a big God that changes the course of history? You were once a great idea in the mind of an almighty God. He uniquely made you blessed you with gifts and abilities to make a difference in the world for him. God's physical manifestation of his, his own eternal plans and purposes, simply put, you are God's what if. What if. The only regrets at the end of our lives will be the time, talent, and treasure that we left on the table and didn't give back to God. When all is said and done, all that matters is hearing God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. What if? Today I want you to imagine with me the future of the church. Imagine with me the, the future of the body, the future of, of this body. This will not be a message that gives you a bunch of answers. This will be a very right brain, creative thinking um, day. And I think that, that God is a creative God. He created us in his image to be creators. And so today I want you to imagine the future. Imagine what the future looks like. I was doing some research earlier this week and um, <clears throat> students were asked this question, do you think that you are creative? Um, they asked uh, different groups over different ages. They asked second graders, do you think you are creative? 95% of second graders said, I think that I'm creative. Same question was asked to fifth graders. 50% of fifth graders think that they are creative. Same question was asked to 12th graders about to leave high school. Do you think that you are creative? 5% of 12th graders said they believe that they are creative. Neuroimaging has shown us that cognitive memory shifts from the imaginative right brain to the logical left over time. Over time, we stop living off of imagination and start living off of memory. That is the point where we stop creating the future and start living in the past, where we stop living by faith and start living by fear. What if? That's the question I want you to, to ask this morning. I want you to ask what if in regards to yourself and your own spiritual life, and your own discipleship, and your own spiritual gifts, but also what if the church, I want you to picture a, a bold, creative, bright vision for the church, because this question, what if, is very different from the, its opposite, which is, if only. We all can ask if only questions, and we have many, many times, if only the church did this, or if only the church didn't do this. We have these questions in our lives as well. If only Coach would have put me in in the fourth quarter. We would have won state. I could throw a pigskin quarter mile. Napoleon Dynamite, like two people watch that movie. Okay. <laughs> so I want you um, for a second to, to think about your if only. What is your if only? If only I would have never met that man, my life would have gone a whole lot better. He cost me a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of emotional energy. If only I would have never met him. So I want you, uh, for the next couple seconds, turn to the person next to you. What is your if only? If only, for, my, for me, it's if only I would have never torn my ACL in high school. I played one high school uh, game as a freshman on the JV team. I, th I caught three touchdown passes. The next practice, I tore my ACL. If only I didn't tear my ACL, I would be in the NFL right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I'd be tithing off of that money, so... Uh, so for the, the, the next couple seconds, turn to your neighbor. What is your if only? Go ahead. Talk to each other.
So we don't normally do this a whole lot, um, talk to each other, um, but I, I want to ask you, uh, just a, a, a few people, what is your if only? If only. Oh, no, talking back in church. Yes, if only. If only I hadn't sold that 69 Mach 1 with a 428 Cobra. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if only. If only. Anyone else? A couple more. Yeah. If I would have asked what God's will was in the situation. Ooh, yeah. We all have those um, spiritual regrets, right? Where we could have gone one direction, but we went another. We have those relational regrets as well. If only I wouldn't have dated that person. Uh, we had some in the, in the first service. If only I would have went to college in my 20s and now I'm paying for it in my 50s. Uh, th those type of questions. We have these, these regrets. And, and if only is not a, uh, a question of imagination. It's a question of um, reliving the past. So I don't want us to ask if only this morning. I want us to ask what if. I want us to imagine a bright future instead of criticizing the future that could be. Um, did you know that they, and I counted, um, there are 1,784 ifs in the Bible. Uh, most of them conditional conjunction, conjunctions based off of um, if we do this, God will respond in this way. If we do this, God will do this. If we uh, listen, God will bless. Those, those type of things. And um, so many times, so many times we, um, we think of potential, especially if you're a sports fan, right? We think of ruined potential, realized potential. Man, this person has so much potential. This quarterback for the Broncos has so much potential, but we're not seeing it. Why are we not seeing it? Potential is God's gift to us. Making the most of it is our gift back. One little if could change anything. One little if could change anything. One little if could change everything. So today I want you to ask what if in regard to the church. I want you to imagine with me a bold future for the church. I want you to stay away this morning from if only, and let's think about what could be. A, a church full of dreamers harmonizing our dreams with the dream of God. And so today we're going to be asking two big questions two big what-if questions to hopefully spark your imagination. And at the end, there's not going to be any, this is the direction we're going. It's really going to be up to you. And I think that today God could do some really big things in our lives and in our, in our church. So, so really take this, take this seriously. Ask this question, what if? And so the first question I have is, what if we believed God is who we claim him to be? What if we believed God is who we claim him to be? Uh, a student came about a year ago before youth group, and if you come before youth group, I assume that you want to talk to me. This kid didn't want to talk to me, he just wanted to play pool, but I took advantage of the situation and, and decided, hey, we're going we're gonna to talk about God. I don't know where this ki kid stood, so I asked a simple question, which is pretty fitting in the context of church, do you believe in God? <laughs> His response is, man, we don't talk about that. What? We're in church. No, we don't talk about God and politics. We don't talk about God and politics. And I said, no, actually here we, we do discuss the G-O-D a little bit. Uh, so I said, hey, man, what, what do you think? Where did all this come from? And, and he's looking at the building. He said, well, construction workers. I said, man, you know what I'm talking about. Where did all this come from? Let's look at this mountain right outside our window. Where did that come from? It's a tectonic plates moving. And man, you know, you know what I am talking about. You know what I'm, I'm talking about. And then, and then he said, well, I said, what do, you, what do you think about the Bible? What do you think about um, God's word? And he said, man, I can't trust it. There are just so many contradictions. I said, well, what, what do you mean when you say contradictions? He said, well, Noah's Ark. Do you really believe that God took two goats and put them on the ark? And then he took two giraffes and put them on the ark. And he took two ants and put them on the ark. I said, man, that, that is a tough one. He caught me off guard there. I, I didn't expect that to come. But, but as Christians, right, we believe that God created the world. And so, so I, I said, hey, man, do you really believe that all of this came from nothing? He said, no, it didn't come from nothing. And I said, well, well, if God could create the ant, is he not powerful enough to put the ant on the boat? Can he not make that ant walk? And so this morning, I want to 
I want to illustrate to you with some, some Play-Doh. I told you we're imagining this morning, and how, what a better way to imagine than with Play-Doh. And uh, I think so many times we get, we get so um, wrapped up in, in who God is that we really don't think about who we are in relation to God. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and create for you uh, this man and I don't know why his head is bigger than his legs. Uh, he kind of looks like a starfish right now. Um, let me give him some liposuction. Um, but I, I, want, I want you to, to really see this morning, and we're going to start with this, is I really want you to see the difference between a created being and a creator. Can, can this created being do whatever it wants? Can, it, it was this created being just created without any kind of purpose? Uh, Romans 9 says, uh, how, what is a man? Can a man really say, why did you make me like this? In, um, in Isaiah chapter 29, it says, does the pot say to the potter, the one who made me is stupid? Can, can we really question God? We call him our, our creator, our maker. We call him God. But do we really think out all the implications of that? In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, um, there's this, this powerful picture. And this is, uh, this is what Paul says about Jesus. He says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Isn't that just humbling to think about? That every person in any position of power all throughout history, that God has placed them there for that specific time. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Do you get this picture? That without God, everything is flying off into space. That, that without God, it is all chaos. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything, he might be preeminent. I want you to think about for a second just this passage in this, this phrase for, all things were created through him and for him. Do we really think that? Do we really believe that, that we were created for his use? Now, if I took the man and I, I said, oh man, I'm just going to make this a bowl and I made, I made the man for, the, for my use and I made the bowl for my use, do you think Think of yourself like that, as a, as a creature in relation to the creator, that you were created for him. And I think, may, maybe you're thinking, oh man, a, a cre I never thought of myself as a creature. Isn't that a little degree? No, think, think of yourself as being uniquely made for the purposes of an almighty God. How powerful is that? And I took this bowl and I put it up on the shelf. I made it for a purpose. And if I, if I made the man and I said, man, I want you to just clean up this carpet, the man is made for a purpose. Most days I don't wake up, my, wake up thinking about I was made for somebody else. Some days I think that God was created for me. And we get this picture in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 of these angels singing out the praise of God for eternity over and over and over, holy, 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 and that all the creatures are bowing down and all the, the 24 elders are there bowing down. And it, it's just so amazing that this picture that is happening for eternity, that we don't even, like, God doesn't need us to worship him. That's just such a humbling thing. And it says this one line. It gives our, our one little role as the saints in God's church. It gives us this one little phrase. It says that the, the prayers of the saints are the incense for God. Have you ever thought of your prayers like that? That, that when I pray to God, when I worship God, when I'm here and gathered in the body, that all I am doing is trying to make a, a fragrance to God. And so many times, me... I get caught up in asking God for so much 
but I never stopped to think He created me for Him. I was created by Him and for Him, and, and your greatest calling may not be to do something great, but to be used by a great God. <clears throat> I wanted to start off with this, with the, this picture of, of who God is, that in everything that He might be preeminent, because where we uh, stare, that's where we will steer. And I want us as a church to steer toward a glorious picture of a God who is in control, who God who is creating all things and holding it all together, a God who created us for him. We will steer where we stare. What if you let go of who you were supposed to be and embraced who you were created to be? Uh, a, a few months ago, we had um, this, this phenomenon called the solar eclipse. And all I saw with this solar eclipse that was happening was this disclaimer. And you probably saw it too, right? Do not stare at the sun. <laughs> Do not stare at the sun. I remember going to uh, my eye doctor. I needed a, a new pair of contacts. And he lectured me for 10 minutes. Maybe he knew my personality, but he said, Mitch, you can't stare at the sun. <laughs> Don't do it. It's going to destroy your retinas. How much more powerful is God than the sun? How much more powerful is, is the God who shines brighter than any other sun? Again, get this picture in Revelation. The sun ceases to exist, and we are all living by the power of God. And now, now think that this power of, of the sun is, is 97 million miles away, right? 98 million miles away, around there. Imagine God's power living within us. How much more powerful is that? What if, my second question, what if we lived our lives directed by the Holy Spirit? What if we really lived our lives directed by the Holy Spirit? The church is not really functioning until every part of the body is using their gift, your own unique gift that God has given to you, that the Holy Spirit is indwelling in you and has, has provided this for you. What if we started living that way? Not a little gift, but a manifestation of God. What if we live that way? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 um, says this. It says, For the body does not consist of one member. I love how he starts, starts it like that, right? Because so many times when we think of church, especially today, when we think of church, we think of, okay, who's the pastor? It, what, name the, the five largest churches. You're probably naming, you know, uh, North Point Church, Andy Stanley. But, but the scripture says, for the body does not consist of one men member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body. How powerful is that? Uh, God arranged you to be a part of this body. And if we're thinking about God, he probably did it before time, before you even existed, but God arranged you to be a part of this body, not to sit and get, but to be an active participant in his body. Each one of them, as he chose, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. What if you lived your life dependent on the body? What if you lived your life dependent on other people? And, and we, don't, we don't live like this. We don't live like this. We don't do church like this. That, that really what we do on Sunday morning is dependent on maybe seven people's spiritual gifts. The band and the speaker. But what if we did church in, in a way that, that our, our spiritual gifts were dependent on other people? Because they are, Right? If we're a part of the body, our spiritual gifts are dependent on other people. We don't just need each other, but according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we are each other. What if the church stopped looking for volunteers? 
What if the church stopped looking for volunteers? What if we had each individual member of the body living out their manifestation of God played out in the, in the world? What if we stopped looking for volunteers? Man, I think our children's ministry would, would be thriving because children are our future. What if we stop looking for volunteers and everyone just live out their own spiritual gifts? And again, I don't have answers to what this looks like. I'm just asking this question. And then he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. What if we were a family instead of a gathering? What if the church looked more like a family? And over the past 10 years, I, I've been involved in, in youth ministry, and I love youth ministry, and I, I view these students as my children, that I am, I'm responsible for them. And just as my children, I am not raising them to live at home forever. I'm raising them to be able to stand on their own two feet, that when my daughters turn 18, I want them to be able to have a job, to engage in society, to make friends, to build great relationships, to be responsible. I'm not raising my, my kids to live at home forever. I'm not doing my job unless I teach these students, unless we teach you to be able to stand on your own two feet. Now, I, I remember when I, was, uh, when I was 18, my youth pastor gave me this responsibility of this group of guys. He said, hey, this is your group. It's not a small group. It is your group. It is your job to disciple them like a family. And he just gave me this responsibility. And just like some of you parents, right, when, when uh, you got your, your baby and you're about to go home, you didn't know what to do. I had no idea what to do. I know I'm not supposed to drop the baby on its head and I should probably feed it every now and then. I had no idea what to do with this group of guys. One of the guys uh, in my, my group started drinking. He started drinking. I think he had one beer and then he told me about it. He felt really bad. I didn't know what to do. I've matured a lot since then. So if you have kids in the youth group, I'm not going to do this. But I took this kid and I took him downtown to where all the drunks are. And I said, look at this. They're like throwing bottles at each other, cussing, like passed out. I said, look at this. This is going to be you. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. <laughs> I remember uh, one of the, the moms of the, one of the boys in my group called me. And she said, man, I'm having problems with my son. I need some parenting advice. I said, hold on, let me talk to my mom. <laughs> <laughs> man. <clears throat> and and what, if you, what if you viewed people like your own spiritual children? And, and it doesn't mean that, that you never get help. That's why we have elders. That's why we have staff. But, but what if you went outside and you made some real disciples? What if you were responsible? What, do, what if we operated like that as a church, where each member was responsible for investing in the lives of other people? And we, we haven't run church that way. I don't know if we've ever run church that way. And I, I'm talking about big, universal, the church. For most people, if you take the senior pastor away, would they even know what to do? And, and just like with my kids, what if we looked at people in the church that way? And so, like, uh, I have a student here in the first row, Angelo. I want to, I want Angelo, if he were the only believer in Lakewood, I want him to be okay. That he would be able to stand on his own two feet. That he would be able to gather a group. That he would be able to disciple and to baptize and to figure out how to pray with others. And that's the goal. That's the goal. And in youth ministry, I have a, a set end time. When they turn 18, when they graduate from high school, they're out of my group. But what if we viewed every believer in the church that way? That we want to train and equip people to stand on their own two feet, to use their gifts for the benefit of the body. This direction where the church is, is heading, where everyone is dependent on a mega church speaker has to die. It has to. And, and we get the, the comment so many times, hey, I'm, I'm not being fed. I'm not being fed. I'm trying it. I'm in a small group. I, I come to church. I'm, I'm not being fed. And, and my response is really like, you're not being fed. You have a feast. Just, just dive in. Eat. 
You don't want to be fed. You want to be coddled. You want the church to meet your needs so that you can consume it a little bit better. You want us to, to, to make it a little bit more milky so that you can drink it and not choke on it. And that's okay. It's okay for a, a certain group for a certain period of time. It's okay to drink spiritual milk. The New Testament tells us that. But it's not okay to stay that way forever. We have to disciple people so that they can stand on their own two feet. We don't want to be people who require something other than God to enjoy God. We don't want to be people who require something other than God to enjoy God. And A.W. Tozer um, puts it like this. He says, if the Holy Spirit was, was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. What if we, we used our spiritual, because that's what's in us anyway, this divine manifestation of God living in us. That's what's in us. And a, a major problem with the church today is what if everybody in the church actually made one disciple? What if everybody in the church made one disciple? That's what we're commanded to do, right, is everyone make one disciple. We don't think of church like that. We build buildings and we say, okay, if everyone in the church made one disciple, we'll add a service. But what if they made one disciple? It eventually caps off, right? And, and I think that that's why so many churches have gone to online content because we actually don't believe that the church can make disciples. We believe that the church can consume church and listen to church and watch it on TV or on their computer, but we actually don't believe that the church can, can make disciples. We're not doing people favors by saying sit and listen. What if the church was known more for its sending capacity than its seating capacity? What if the church was more than a gathering? Because Jesus says that you will receive power. You, believer, will receive power not to sit and consume or go to church or go to a building, but you will receive power to be my witnesses. Do we think of ourselves like that? Uh, I believe that this is a historical fact that everywhere that believers have gone with the gospel, everywhere that believers have traveled with the gospel, churches have been formed. So why is it a, a four to one? 4,000 churches close, 1,000 uh, churches are started every year. Why aren't churches being planted all over the place? Because I don't believe that people are going anywhere with the gospel. Man, I don't get it. We have this divine manifestation of God in us. Philippians chapter 1, <clears throat> starting in verse 27, says this. And I think that this is the key, and this is the missing element to the church in America today. He says this, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. If we just boiled it down to that, I think we would get it. But then he says, So whether I come or, or see you when, or am I or am I absent, I hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. Can you just, would you define the church like that? If somebody asks you what you do, man, man th this group, we're just standing firm in one spirit, that we just love each other. He says, with one mind, which is a miracle, by the way, right? With one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them, your opponents, of their destruction, but of your salvation. And that from God. He says, it's not about a stage. It's not about a speaker. It's not about the band. It's not about lights. It's not about buildings. It's about when you become one, that's when people will know that you are my disciples. That's when they will know of their own destruction. How many people out there know of their own destruction? Uh, we have people in the court, uh, church, teachers, saying that they don't even believe in their own destruction. This is so countercultural because so many of us, we say, man, if this person came to, if this person on The Bachelor just came to, to faith with their reach, if this athlete just came to faith, or if this band were here, or if this speaker just spoke it to, that's, that's when the church would grow, or if Hillsong were here, or some dynamic celebrity. He says, no. It's when you love each other. It's when you become one. That's when 
people will know. Nobody, nobody is thinking that. We're not, we're not thinking about that. I, I put this question out on my um, Facebook page, and I just said, hey, uh, I want you to fill in the blank. What if church? What if church? Imagine with me. What if church? And people didn't say, what if the church had a better band? What if the church had better lighting? What if the church had fog machines? I said, what if the church stopped being hypocrites? What if the church stopped being judgmental? What if the church started being real? Essentially, what if the church loved each other? Because that's what it's about, and that's what it's pointing to. It's not about big stages or big people or big personalities. It's about, hey, do you want to grow the church? The body needs to start loving each other. That we need to start being dependent on each other. I started asking um, this question two years ago. Um, what if in regard to church? What if in regard to church? Where, where do you think God would take you if you asked that question? So about two years ago, Anna and I felt a nudge. What if we planted a church? What if we planted a church? Really asking, what if this kind of community really existed? So last January, Anna and I went to Orlando for a church planting uh, assessment. And so over the course of three days, we were tested, evaluated, psycho-evaluated, marriage counseled, and run through the ringer, to, with all with the intent to discern whether or not we are church planters. And so over the course of those three days, God revealed to um, my wife and I and Ben and Pat and this, this team of people that we are actually supposed to plant a church, that we are a full recommend to plant a church. And so we don't know when or what or where, but Anna and I are asking this question along with our elder board, what if? What if this kind of community actually existed? What if? And so I want to... Uh, I want to personalize this for you. What if you started a movement? So I'm going to show you a, a video. I think we have some time. I don't know uh, where we're at. Yeah, we have a little bit of time. I want to show you this video um, about how to start a movement. What if each believer in the church did this? So can we pull that up? Do we have it? What if you were like this guy? Now, now the, the key to any movement, the key to any dynamic growth is one individual being able to stand out and be ridiculed. By the way, that looks like Stephen, doesn't it, our worship leader? Uh, <laughs> the key is, check it out, he has one follower. And what he does with this one follower is he engages him. That he trains this one follower, and then here in just a second, this one follower does something powerful. He calls to his friends, hey, I want you to come and enjoy this with me. I want you to come. And so the key is, is your, your first follower. What if, have you ever asked this question? What if people followed me as I followed Christ? This is, this is critical in, in just a second. Um, here's the critical turning point. As others start to join the movement, it becomes, less, <laughs> it becomes less about the leader and more about the community, more about the experience. It's no longer about the leader. It's about them. It's no longer about me. It's about we. And so as, as Christians, we need to get new followers to emulate the followers, not the leader. It becomes less and less about the leader and more and more about the followers. It's got to be about the movement, not you. And this is how a movement starts. And this is how the church in America will change. And I just love this. It is about being having a ridiculous out there what if faith. If I stand here and just do what God has called me to do and embrace those followers, follow me as I follow Christ, a movement can happen. People will not remember the leader. They will remember the gathering. They will remember the experience. They will remember their own personal feelings as to what happened that day.
What if? What if? Everything begins with an idea. One great idea can change the world. Big dreams backed up by bold actions change the direction of our lives and change the course of history. One scribble in your notepad, text in your notes. One spark of inspiration. One unlikely invention. I have a dream. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think different, just do it. Ideas that sparked movements that continue to change the world. What if we as a church fully embrace the fact that we are divinely designed and uniquely equipped and fully empowered to do big things for a big God that changes the course of history? You were once a great idea in the mind of an almighty God. You were uniquely made for him. God blessed you with gifts and abilities to make a difference in the world for him. God's physical manifestation of his own eternal plans and purposes, simply put, you are God's what if. What if. The only regrets at the end of our lives will be the time, talent, and treasure that we left on the table and did not give back to God. When all is said and done, all that matters is hearing God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. What if. Let's pray. Father, we are just so thankful for this time together to imagine as a church, to dream about your direction for our lives. And so God, I pray that as this body imagines that we would continue to grow closer together, but God, that we would continue to grow closer to you, that our heart would reflect your heart, that our body would be connected to your body, that our love for one another would make a difference in the world and in this community. God, thank you for empowering us and working in us and working through us. God, we love you. And we thank you for your son. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.